Hello and welcome to Analysis with me, John Rees. Well, we're used to hearing U.S. presidents declare war. It's more unusual to hear one declare that war is over. Yet that's what some reports are suggesting Barack Obama told an audience last week, out of all places, the West Point Military Academy. But his speech was made the day after he confirmed that nearly 10,000 troops will remain in Afghanistan post-withdrawal. This, and the bellicose rhetoric directed at Russia, not to mention the increases in arms spending and drone warfare, seem to suggest that deeds are by departing from words. So what exactly is Obama's vision for the future of U.S. foreign policy? Let's take a look at this report. In a congressional address last Wednesday, President of the United States, Barack Obama, called on American Congress to support a proposed $5 billion counterterrorism fund to aid countries across the Horn of Africa and the Arab Peninsula in combating terrorism. Speaking to cadets at the United States Military Academy at West Point, Obama announced that the foreseeable future, the most direct threat to America at home and abroad, remains terrorism. While the request has come as a surprise to lawmakers and prefects, others seem less surprised by Obama's new course of action that covertly extends the global war on terror as opponents have criticized. The fund, if agreed upon, will be added to Pentagon's already overstretched budget for 2015. The speech comes only one day after the president submitted a blueprint for ending America's military engagement in Afghanistan. America's combat mission will be over by the end of this year. American personnel will be in an advisory role. We will no longer patrol Afghan cities or towns, mountains or valleys. That is a task for the Afghan people. Obama administration officials told Reuters last month that the number of U.S. military troops in Afghanistan may well drop below 10,000 beyond 2014. The president's decision to support a train, advise and assist mission provides us the opportunity to finish developing a capable, incredible Afghan army and police force. We'll also continue to keep pressure on al-Qaeda with a sustained counterterrorism effort. The power emitted by Obama's spoken words signals a shift in America's post-war foreign policy, alongside new directions in technological means and long-term strategies. Opponents continue to lambast these moves as attempts to revive America's declining leadership, fearing the rise of drone warfare as the continuation of U.S. hegemony by other means. The drone campaign guided by the Obama administration was introduced with the aim of dismantling al-Qaeda in Pakistan and Afghanistan and preventing their return to the wider region. Today, the U.S. operates over 1,000 bases scattered across a variety of discrete areas and locations outside of U.S. territories, which make up 60 bases worldwide, all used in drone operation. Some claim these expansive measures constitute a new form of empire reliant on covert drone operations. Meanwhile, the issue of Syria remains high on the agenda for the White House, as Obama made clear in his speech on Wednesday. But Obama's rejection of an isolationist policy and claims that military force is the only way to affirm American leadership has aroused considerable suspicion of the means with which America will enact its fight against terrorism. But can a $5 billion counterterrorism partnership fund bring to an end America's interventionism abroad and open up a new chapter in the story of America's leadership upon the international stage? Nazli Tazi, Islam Channel. Well, to examine these issues, I'm joined in the studio by Professor Keith Hayward, Head of Research at the Royal Aeronautical Society, and Peter Finn, Lecturer in Politics at Kingston University. On Skype, we're joined by Chris Cole, who's the coordinator of the Drain Wars UK campaign. Well, welcome to the programme, all of you. Um, uh, Peter, what, was this a coherent speech? Lots of the critics are saying, you know, uh, all right, he's covering all the bases. He's saying we can't do the unpopular things that we did in Iraq and Afghanistan, but on the other hand, we're not ruling them out. Um, I suppose it's quite reflective of Obama's foreign policy sort of in the past, for the past sort of six years, and you would imagine as it would continue in for the, you know, the kind of lame duck part of his presidency. Um, was it coherent? I mean, it certainly drew on lots of parts of historical rhetoric and discourse from US foreign policy. He used a kind of infamous phrase that the US is the indispensable nation, which obviously was made famous by Madeleine Albright in the 90s. So. He certainly was deliberately trying to tap into historical narratives. 
whether it was coherent, I, I don't know. I think lots of the press around it has been slightly simplistic, especially around the five, this five billion dollar fund. I, it does it like I mean, obviously five billion dollars is a lot of money, but it's it's less than one percent of the U.S.'s overall budget for defence. So I don't think. And, and mo lots of the money that um, has been allotted to it in the countries that it's going to would be to places that the money would be going anyway. So I think um, th some of the press sort of needs to be slightly more nuanced around it. Um, and whether it was coherent, I suppose we'll have to see and see w whether there are actually changes. I mean, the US is drawing down in Afghanistan, has drawn down um, in Iraq. Um, and whether or not Obama is true to his word, we'll have to see. And I guess maybe in the future we can see whether it's coherent. Mm. I mean, Keith, are these things that look like a kind of, you know, foreign policy that's shaped by the Iraq syndrome in the way that, you know, some of the foreign policy after the defeat in Vietnam was shaped by a Vietnam syndrome? I think inevitably um, events, contemporary events are to some extent coloured by past experience as well as by contemporary political pressures. So it's evident that uh, Obama wants out at least in terms of feet on the ground in, 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 in areas that he inherited from the Bush administration. But there are you know, political pressures in Congress particularly that have seen in his foreign policy in the last three or four years elements of weakness. And in a sense, he's walking out a fine political line between these two often contradictory forces. Mm. Uh, Chris Coles, I mean, you know, whatever else might be happening, you know, you're looking at a, a, at a, at a, at a boom industry in for uh, the American the American military. Um, uh, do, do you expect uh, to see um, this area of American uh, warfare increase in significance? Do, do you trust some of the things that Obama said previously about um, transparency in this area? Well, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to trust and agree with what he says. I mean, what he seems to be saying is what people want to hear. But he also seems to be continuing to do what the U.S. always wants to do, which is, as he said, you know, act unilaterally in their core interests. And so we will, I think, see, continue to see the, the rising use of drones around the globe. But I think there is a kind of desire, both here in the U.K. and in the U.S., to, quote, unquote, draw a line under, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and move on. And that's why I think we're seeing this new... Uh, push towards looking at, uh, what did he say, uh, places where there may be a foothold uh, for terrorism in, in Africa and, and, and the Middle East. So that's why we're seeing uh, the kind of rhetoric saying that we're going to move on, but the, the use uh, of uh, unilateral military force will continue. Mm. I mean, Keith, uh, there was a there was an interesting line in the speech where he said, you know, about, about the use of drones. Yeah. That um, you know that, that we have to we have to take out more enemies on the battlefield than we create by the use yeah. of drones. Is, is this a technology that can actually do that? Well, it's a, I, it's often seen as a, a as a transformatory, revolutionary technology. All of this remotely piloted stuff is offering the military options that they wouldn't necessarily have had in the past. Persistence up to many hours, so perhaps even days, if you cycle the um, the system through. Certainly, it's it's a the persistence and the, the safety offered um, offered the system is by the system is of course very tempting uh, from the military. Um, th they do potentially offer precise strike for the relatively few armed drones that are actually available to the United States. You shouldn't overestimate the numbers. Here we're talking probably around about a hundred of, 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 of the Reaper types that that. that commonly carry carry weapons so it's 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 a small relatively small force but does offer from an air power perspective very precise or relatively precise capability of hitting targets mm. i mean you, all right you can see you can see why they like it because mm. there's there's nobody out there to be shot down yeah but, uh, you know, if you're on the receiving end of this, I mean, all the experience of the reaction of the population yeah. in Afghanistan or massive political reaction in Pakistan, certainly, you know, if it's judged by, by that sentence in Obama's speech, it ain't working. It's the distance. I think there's been some work done on uh, reactions in the, in, in the, in the tribal, in the tribal um, homelands that there is a sort of, it's dishonourable. It's the, the, the distance in gay, involved by using um, remotely piloted aircraft is somehow seen as less honest when you've got guys who are actually flying or, or, or 
using or loosening the, loosening the missiles several thousand miles away. Though, interestingly enough, distance has always been an issue here. You can go back to the American Civil War and the use of snipers mm. was criticized for exactly the same reasons, distance from, from, from the actual sharpest end of combat. Well, let me just put that, because we're just dealing with the drones thing, to, to, to Chris a moment. I mean, I mean Chris, I mean, uh, you know, maybe as Keith says, that's an aspect of it, but, but surely the thing that's driven the reaction on the ground is, in any culture, it's pretty bad if your wedding party gets blown up. Absolutely, and I think one of the difficulties that we have with the drones is this kind of, you know, connection with this idea of, as Keith has said, precision, pinpoint accuracy. And I think that we can all get so carried away with this Hollywood idea that you can launch a weapon from 10 miles away and hit very precisely the individual and not have any civilian casualties. And we know from uh, the reliable reports and information coming out from Pakistan that hundreds, hundreds of, of civilians have been killed. So over, over in the West, we have, we've been taken away with this idea of precision, that we can just take out the bad guys and leave all the innocent behind. But the people on the, on the ground in Afghanistan and Gaza and Pakistan know the reality of so-called precision warfare. And it's creating, not creating security at all, it's just creating the opposite. Uh, Peter, um, in terms of the just to move you know back again to the more to the more general uh, focus uh, focus here, do you think that we're in a a kind of Iran contra phase of American foreign policy <laughs> where you know the kind of you know the boots on the ground thing is so yeah. unpopular and it's not working, and so the and so the emphasis on surveillance, on drone warf warfare, on uh, special troops operations yeah. is is it for the moment? Um, I, I mean, I guess that's probably it's quite a good parallel. I mean, and one of the important things to understand about drones in general is you can't you can't understand what's going on with drones without understanding how JSOC operate or understanding the many bases that the US has and the different alliances that the US has, um, both sort of in like I don't mean like the term, but I suppose the Western world, if 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 we can define it as that, and and within uh, if I suppose if we talk about sort of the Middle East and Africa. You can't truly understand how drones operate without understanding that. And, and we've got quite a lot out of, obviously, from the Edward Snowden revelations um, in it, and the sort of complicity with um, other states. Obviously, the UK is, we're massively, the, the British state is massively involved in that and um, through GCXQ and the numerous US bases here. But also you've seen kind of things, other states where you wouldn't necessarily expect them to to be as complicit. Um, Australia, in, the, in the last couple of weeks, there's been reports about Australia um, and New Zealand um, having their information that's come from their um, intelligence services being used in the sort of targeting for drones and stuff. So, um, yeah, I think probably we are seeing a reaction to, um, sort of, yeah, the boots on the ground kind of US exceptionalism post 9-11 um, to different more covert uh, or, or clandestine, to use it, sort of another um, technical <laughs> US foreign policy term, to try and still further the, the interests that were could be done via kind of very explicit means post, immediately post 9-11 anyway. Mm. Keith, do you think this can last beyond the kind of Obama moment? I mean, if we were, you know, as, you know, as Peter was saying, we're in the end of the Obama mm. presidency now. I mean, maybe you're looking at Hillary Clinton, maybe you're looking at somebody from the John McCain wing of the Republican yeah. Party. Um, neither of those two would be likely to shape American, insofar as the American president actually does shape mm. foreign policy. Gonna, gonna, you can't imagine either of them making a speech like this, can you? It's difficult. I, it, it, again, I think Obama has had this reputation of, of, of trying to get it both ways, that he wants to seem at one stage as I've said before, pulling out of the, the Bush administration, which was a cowboy foreign policy, if you want to describe it crudely. But he's also, in a sense, keen to act in a relatively tough consi manner, consistent with, with a, a heritage of American foreign policy. I think anybody who follows Obama from, from ne from in the, in the ne after the next presidential election is going to face similar pressures. If it's somebody on the, the hawkish side of American foreign policy, they're going to face pressures from the American political system to avoid committing ground troops. There will be financial restrictions on what 
they can do to, by way of spending on defense policy. It, it's still a huge defense budget. The United States will be the largest military power by a long way for the foreseeable future. But in terms of actual availability of cash to fund new systems, including new remotely piloted vehicles, will be relatively constrained. So I think there are... It's going to be much the same, I suspect, whoever is, whoever is in the White House uh, for, uh, for over, in the next four, or five, four to eight years. Mm. That's interesting. I mean, Chris, do, do, do you read it that way? Or, or, or do you think that, you know, post-Obama, the kind of the, the, the voices on the, on the kind of neocon right that are basically saying, look, you can't run an empire this way, um, will gain traction after Obama goes? Well, it's difficult to forecast, but I mean, I do see us going into um, a kind of a, a bit of a pause at the moment, uh, over, certainly over the next 18 months to two or three years, where there will be a kind of re reassessment and reanalysis, and there will be further investment into the key uh, technologies and the key uh, areas or ways of fighting over the next decade. And that is, as others have said, you know, the use of drones, the use of special forces, and the use of private military contracts contractors. That is the way forward. It's hard, pretty hard to see. I mean, nobody knows what is going to happen and events do change, but it is pretty hard to see a mass, you know, in, uh, invasion, with hundreds of thousands of troops over the, over the next few years. And so the idea of concentrating on drones and special forces and private military companies will very much come to the fore. And I think that there is, in, in particular in the area of drones, the kind of we all know that the drones that we have at the moment, the Predator and Reaper drones, are pretty crude and are easy. It can only really be used in areas where there is no proper air defense systems. But that's rapidly changing. We're seeing new drones coming uh, into service, coming off the drawing board, and those will too change the nature of warfare. And so we will, I think, be able to see much more short-term light nano wars, uh, uh, as it's called, over the next uh, decade or two. That's the likelihood. Okay. So, Peter, do you think that one of the, one of the things that's producing this this pause? I mean, we, you know, we've talked about the the sort of Iraq syndrome, but but is it also that you know, unlike the the wars of the wars on uh, of the war on terror, uh, where we saw basically the large military powers in more or less more or less reluctant agreement that they were going to whack a much smaller power, um, it is now the emerging threat of China and the emerging sort of resilience of the. Um, of, of the Russian regime. Is that causing a problem in the sense that the Americans don't like it, but they don't really have the force projection to deal with it militarily? Um, I mean, obviously, there's a, yeah, I mean, there's a huge difference between deciding illegally <laughs> to mm. overthrow what was, of course, the heinous regime in Iraq um, to thinking that you could ever or would ever want to invade China. Um, <laughs> but again, I suppose a lot of the analysis can be quite crude, right? So if you think about China, China's rise and the way that China is rising, um, uh, on the whole, not totally, but on the whole, it benefits the US-run system because um, it generally um, trades sort of, or is at least moving towards trading on the open market. It's not to say that it doesn't kind of strike a deal and kind of poke its finger in the eye of the US with Iran for, you know, a certain amount, like bartering for oil or something like that. Um, or, uh, but, but, you know, China um, holds massive amounts of US debt, and that's often held up as this thing that's going to bring down the American empire. Well, yes, that obviously, that debt which China holds gives... Chinese a certain amount of systemic power in the international system. But if you think about it a bit more in a bit more nuanced way, what it actually does um, is ties the success, of, the success of the US economy into the success of the Chinese economy, because the last thing China would want is for the value of that debt to kind of totally fall off a cliff and suddenly what was one dollar is now 20 cents. You know, um, I suppose it's this is an old adage, you know, if you, if you owe the bank a thousand pounds the bank owns you, but if you owe the bank a million pounds, you own the bank. Mm. And I suppose there's a lot of that to it. So there is obviously, of course, the kind of much vaunted pivot to Asia, where you've got um, US battle carriers and all of the kind of paraphernalia that goes with that moving into the Asia region. Um, and there's I, obviously, with the sort of rising power of China, lots of the other Asian nations, uh, South Korea, Japan, um, are sort of see themselves as being 
sort of maybe under threat because of that. But I, I don't know. I'm not so. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying the Chinese state is perfect. Far from it, in fact. But um, I, I certainly don't think the U.S. state is perfect either. I think. Keith, I mean, that, we'll come back to some of the economic issues involved involved there. But I mean, we've heard a lot about the, the yeah. pivot to the Pacific. Um, but um, there was almost no mention of it in the West Point speech. There was more time devoted to Burma than there was to the pivot to the Pacific. It, uh, it, What's going on there? Well, I, I think, in a sense, um, you could say uh, that's the done deal. I mean, the, the pivot to Asia has been announced. Uh, the caveat here, of course, is is the um, the Ukraine-Russia issue that is making the United States not rethink its policy towards Europe, but has reinforced again that there are other parts of the world of importance to um, the tonight, that aren't in the Middle East, aren't in the Far East. But I think the long-term trend is towards the Pacific, partly because of the, of the rising military power of China, uh, even though there are these economic ties that are quite rightly um, noted. Nonetheless, the, the clamour coming from um, America's Pacific Asian allies to help to provide a necessary beefed up um, support for their increasingly tense relations with, with China, I think is a done deal. And there was no, there's no withdrawal from that. Uh, Chris, do you think that the that you know the aspects of of drone warfare that you've talked about, it, it, up to and including the new developments that you were that you were talking about, um, uh, you know, they seem when you when you look at, at, at these kind of conflicts to be um, very very marginal weapon systems. Is that true, or or could they play a role in in sort of much more um, direct and uh, 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 and larger conflicts between between states? Well, we have just. Just literally this week, seen uh, U.S. Um, global hawk drones, the, the massive surveillance drones, be deployed to Japan. And I think when we're talking about the pivot to the Pacific, although it seems quite bizarre, that certainly includes Africa, because there is, uh, you know, just as there were, were proxy wars between the USSR and and the U.S. in in other places, I think there are likely to be proxy conflicts or tensions between China and the U.S. in Africa, and we are certainly. Uh, hearing lots of hints, lots of suggestions about uh, uh, British and the U.S. drones heading to Africa. So, although you, as, as you rightly say, you know, drones are can be seen to be quite a minor uh, issue when you're talking about geopolitics, they are certainly involved. I, I, I don't want to contest too much of what you say, Chris, but I think the, there is a risk of overstating uh, the significance of um, remotely piloted systems, particularly in, in what you might call really hot conflict, partly because they, have, they, have, they are quite vulnerable um, to active air defence. They're, they're no, they have no real capability of self-defence. And I think it's certainly going to be several, maybe at least a decade before we can see the, the advent of a, of, a, of a more sophisticated um, remotely piloted system that will have this capability through maneuver or through stealth or through self-defense to actually survive in a, in a, in a hot war. Mm. And I think we all should also see that necessarily we, we, our powers are often seen or, or painted as bogey vehicles. They actually, can, in some respects, can be very useful in, in policing a, a, a tense arena, providing relatively impoverished states with an ability to protect themselves. The United Nations force in Congo is using an Italian-funded, an Italian system to actually facilitate its peacekeeping activities in a very remote, very difficult um, part of the world. There are uses and, for these systems. And Amazon are going to deliver books with them, apparently. Oh, well, <laughs> again, I think that's, 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 that, that's a, a, a red herring. Of, that Amazon, I think, got a lot of free publicity out of it. <laughs> but uh, we should be careful to differentiate here between the uses of remotely piloted systems. Okay, well, fair enough. But, but when, when the military, and we've heard yeah. they are thinking uh, about what happens in... Um, in Ukraine or power projection, yeah. are, are there other systems coming online? Briefly, because we're moving towards the break. Um, yes, but a decade away before you get a significant qualitative change in the nature of, uh, of the systems that will be available. OK, uh, well, that's an uh, a brief answer, and it's exactly what we needed because we're coming up to the break. But uh, do come back because we'll be pursuing these and other issues uh, that came out of the West Point speech by President Obama last week uh, in the second half of the programme. Join us after the break. <laughs> 